I'm Lips from Anvil. You're watching South Detroit Soundhouse. Hey all, welcome back to South Detroit Soundhouse. My name is Randy Falsetta and tonight we are in uh, Windsor, Canada at the backstage with our uh, notorious rock and roll metal god here, uh, Lips from Anvil, everyone. Welcome. Hi, everybody. <laughs> nice to meet you, nice to see you. Nice to be met. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you've been, uh, you've been around since 78 with the band. Yeah. Uh, did you, for, it's almost 40 years now. Did you ever think that you'd still be, you know, rocking out, doing shows? Well, what else would I be doing? Well, did you ever think you'd be doing this <laughs> yeah. for 40 years? Yeah. It wasn't a plan to do it for a year. It was a plan, this is what I'm going to do for my life. I don't do anything better, so why would I do anything else? Yeah. So, this is what I do. Yeah. So at what, at what age did you really know that this is what you wanted to do? Like, Ten. was it 10? <laughs> really? 10. Yeah. So every, every, every you know, rock musician has an inspiration, obviously, and you know, at 10 years old, who were you, who were you listening to? And well, at, at, that, at that particular time, it, it was the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, but it, even previous to that, I'd become attached to music even before that. You know, born in the 50s by the time, okay, you know, I mean, you know, I was aware of Elvis Presley and Chuck Berry and stuff like that even before the Beatles. And really, AM radio. Mm. You know, as a little kid, I—I yeah. I don't know if you remember them, but they were called crystal radios, and they—we were talking really long time ago. The crystal okay. radios that used to, used to. All you have to do is uh, put a, an alligator clip on anything that's metal that in around the house to ground it, and it becomes a radio. Yeah. A radio, and you put a little headphone in, and <laughs> the antenna that stuck out of the. <laughs> I, 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 I don't. I, I think I must have been, you know, between, you know, pre ten years old, okay. and that's what I used for my radio. And I'd sit and listen for hours on end to it. Yeah. So I was aware of what was going on, you know, yeah. in the late fifties and early sixties. So by the time that the Beatles happened, I was well, I was well ready for it. And I'd go down to my dad's tailor shop in downtown Toronto, and there was a, a music store right, next, right a couple doors down, and I used to just stand there and stare at the electric guitars thinking, yes. I want one of these one, yeah. one day. And as it turned out, the guy who owned the store came into my dad's tailor shop and said, well, give me a deal on a, on a suit, and I'll give, you, I'll give you an electric guitar. And my dad did, and that's... The beginning of the nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> beginning of the journey. Yeah. So, any plans for the uh, 40th year celebration? No. If you were to, if you were to do something, I don't. I don't do? really pay attention to time. Um, you know, it, it drives my wife crazy in the sense that you never remember remember birthdays, you never remember uh, anniversaries. I go, well, you know, the more you look at a calendar, the older you get. Yeah. <laughs> That's the yeah. way I look at it. You keep marking each year and you start realizing how old you are. If you don't think about it, it never bothers you. Yeah. You never really, the only thing that you have that gives you a, a sense of time is, is music. Hmm. You know, True. go back and listen True. to an album from the 70s and yeah. I'm transported back to the 70s. I know where I was, what I was doing, yeah. when it happened. That's true, that's true. Um, so the tour, starting off tonight in Canada. Yeah. And uh, we got some Ontario dates, some Quebec dates, and then uh, in the fall, it's uh, South America. Right. So do you still enjoy touring? Of course. It's what I, it's what I do. That's when I, how I make my living. <laughs> is, it the, is it the necessary evil, or is it just... Oh, like, I don't look at it as okay. evil at all. Not at all. It, it's, uh, it's a necessity. That's what you do this for. You record albums so you can go out and play. Yeah. The, whole, the whole point is going out and playing. Yeah. A lot of musicians get jaded and bitter to, or, and they don't like to go out and play. Well then, quit. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, quit it and get out of my way. <laughs> I mean, so, that's the way yeah. I look at it. It's like, what are you doing in the business if you don't want to go out and play? 
Yeah, well, there's those recording artists that are just like recording artists, right? And like you said, they don't go out. But if you, if you, I mean, I, I hate to ask you to pick, but do you have a preference between recording or playing live? Is there playing live? Yeah, flat okay. out, no question about it. And in fact, that's what I did for the first three, four years is just play live. There was no recording. Yeah. So, and not to, not not even to mention all the years up to, until the band got joined, I wasn't recording. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, writing, yes. I love to write. I live for that too. And that's a great deal of enjoyment. But the whole point of writing is so that you can take it out and play it to people. That's Otherwise, right. why are you writing? If you're writing to play to the four walls in your living room. It's mm -hmm. pretty much spinning yeah. your wheels. You're not really yeah. doing anything. Yeah, you get that instant gratification from the fans and stuff. We yeah, that's all right. Exactly. Live for, right? Yeah. So, so being Canadian, and, I, and you know, here we are and in Canada, I'm Canadian, and I just, you know, I have this affinity with Canadian bands, and, and you know, it, it always seems to me like bands like, you know, the, you know Rush and Loverboy and whatnot, they always kind of have to preface, you know, being a, a band with saying, well, we're a Canadian band. So, you know, when we're American bands, they just, it just, it's just like a given. So do you think that, they, that uh, Canadian bands have to prove themselves more than any other, you know, country or... Um, well, you know what? It's, it's, it's about the U.S. market. That's what gives us a kind of a warped, a warped view of what, what we need to be or what we have to be. But the real truth is most of, most of the greatest, greatest things in rock music have been discovered and, and by Canadians and ripped off by the American bands. Very, very common, very, very typical. I mean, there's a lot of great Canadian bands that never get the light of day in America, but have inspired all the American musicians, and they're all doing the, they're all doing what, yeah. what the Canadian band inspired or, or whatever. But they never get the the Canadian guys never get the credit. Yeah. But that has to do with more with the greed and ignorance. Of, of a of a business of the business itself, okay. you know. Did you ever consider? I know, I know you, I've seen you in an interview online, and you know you said uh, there's no place like home being Canada, right? Have you right, ever absolutely. have you ever considered moving elsewhere, L.A.? Uh, no, you know, no, no, no. Relocating the family? No, never, It'll never happen. Canada is by far the greatest place to live. And to and to just exist. Period. It's the cleanest place. It's the the one of the least threatening places to to mm -hmm. to travel and 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 mingle with the people. Um, you can't compare it to anything anywhere else in the world, really. So you're proud to be Canadian, just like me. Oh, I'm more than proud to be Canadian. <laughs> I, I I I wear the Canadian emblems every everywhere right. I play. And truth be told, it's it's hugely respected to the point where you know we made uh, T-shirts with the Canadian uh, with the Canadian maple leaf on it, and of course with the fucking A. <laughs> okay. I mean, because of our way that we right. talk, which is much like, in a certain sense, similar to Australia. Okay. Well, I'll get into that in a moment, but it, it's it's actually interesting to when you come to realize how much we're part of the British Commonwealth. But you wouldn't know that if you just live in Canada and never visited the other the other English speaking ports in the world. Um, Canada is unfortunately influenced by what's south of us, and that's the, that's actually the detrimental part. Yeah. You're right. You're right. <laughs> I have to honestly say, uh, for some reason, we seem to gravitate towards some of the negative, st more towards the negative stuff that comes from from America. Uh, certainly, our 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 outlook on on politics uh, seems to shadow our shadow us, and, and gives us makes us a little bit more angry than we should be about things that really have nothing to do with it. Our, our society, but yet we seem to think that they do. 
and I'm just talking about things in particular. Um, there's been, I think in the, in, in the last few months, I don't think I could have felt a deeper humiliation and embarrassment what, when the guy in Quebec went into a mosque and murdered six or seven people. I couldn't feel more humiliated, embarrassed about it because it's the, the of all places in Canada and, and then to even more so in Quebec. What? Yeah, it, those are really those are the negatives that we seem to pick up on. God only knows why. Um, but it's generally a really, really great place to live. It is, it is, what our our prime minister says it is. It's it's our our, our diversity is what makes us mm -hmm. makes us great and what makes us strong. It's not the separating. Um, you know, these are things that I'm very proud of about my country. It's not just that. Uh, musically speaking, we've, you know, as far as Anvil is concerned, or Rush, or April Wine, we've, we've been doing it a lot longer, like in rock music, than anything south of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and we're doing it long before they, a lot of the bands existed. Um, America is very, very much about trends. We're a little bit more like Britain, where, or even Europe, more so than, than that, but less trend-oriented, a lot more individual way of thinking. If it gets me off, I don't give a shit what the rest of the world thinks. Right, right, right. Um, and that's, that, that's sort of a Canadian way, we, and we don't give up. You know, That's true. <laughs> you just keep at it. Doesn't yeah. matter. I mean, when I started, when I started my band, everybody thought I was crazy, but I didn't stop. And it wasn't easy to get gigs here, but they gave them to me. Mm -hmm. They gave me my opportunity that I needed. Thank goodness, you know. So I'm, I'm, you know, I would I ever leave this country? Absolutely not. Never. Not for any reason. Right. No, it's great to hear, man. You know, it's great, you know, the, the loyalty you have to your country is amazing. Um, on a musical note, I just want to kind of shift gears here a little bit, uh, talk about, uh, you know, bands of today and, and whatnot. And, I, and I'm a musician myself. I play guitar and, and uh, so I can relate to the, to the industry really well, I think. And, uh, and it's just, you know, I always wonder what it takes um, to make it these days. And I hate to say make it because um, everybody's definition is different. But uh, is it the songwriting? Is it is it the the proficiency on the instrument? Is it the live performance? Is it is it a shtick? What do you think it is after all these years? Well, it's a number of different things. It's it's everything you just said, but more than more than all of it is uniqueness. If you have no uniqueness, you've got nothing. You know what I what I always tell kids in young bands: if you're going to do this. You better come up with something that no one else does and that only right. you can do. Then you got a chance. Otherwise, you don't. You don't really have a chance. You can't. You can't play follow the leader in this. Yep. In this business, you got to be the leader or the the uh, innovator, the guy who invents the new thing. Otherwise, you're you're just going to be standing at the back of the line with all yep. the other copycats. Yep. You don't get anywhere like that. So what is and that? I mean, that, that's been my, I don't know whether that's a Canadian philosophy, but it's certainly been my own since I was a little kid. I saw no point in figuring out what, uh, what was on the record. I could listen to it and then kind of figure out what, how to make those sounds, but not copy directly what was on the record, like figuring it out note for note. There's no point. Mm -hmm. I, to me, that, that is a, a, an exercise in futility because at the end of the day, it's already done. Yep. What are you doing it again for? You, all you're gonna do, all you, and then when you go to write, all you can think of is that? No, you're better off. See, I learned how to play from writing my own music okay. rather than copying. So at the end of the day, you're actually, right, if you go in with the right attitude, I'm gonna be creative rather than I'm gonna copy everything I can get my hands on, you'll be way better off, especially because that's how you got used to used to your your instrument is by experimentation and creativity rather than rather than what's that guy doing hmm how is it being done mm -hmm. you get so tied up in that that you lose creativity so you got to 
and 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 that's that's my own personal philosophy. It doesn't mean that it's going to work the same for everybody, but for me, that's the way it worked. Since I, since I first day that I got my guitar, I started making stuff up, and before I knew it, I was making up lots of different things, and I could play. So thinking outside the box. Yeah, you know, if you if you're constantly worrying about what the other guy did, you you you're actually you're actually inhibiting yourself. You're putting parameters when you shouldn't have any parameters. So you have an open book. What happens if you do this? What happens if you do that? What happens if you play these two notes together? Listen to it. Does it sound good? No. Don't play it like that again. You know what I mean? You don't need to listen. You don't need to copy somebody else to learn how to play. You need to sit down with your instrument and experiment as much as you possibly can. And from that, you learn how to play and you write songs. And that's what it's really about. It's about cre creating your own thing. And if you don't, you won't get anywhere. It's not possible. Yeah. You don't make it by playing somebody else's songs unless you're, <laughs> yeah. unless you're, that's what you set out to do is yeah. be a copy band. And there's plenty of that. Oh, there is. No, but I just wonder about the longevity of who's out there today. And, and that's kind of why I went about the question to see, you know, who's, how do you, make, how do you be, become successful in the music industry? But your, your legacy is long. And so, you know, you're, to, to hear your, your thoughts on that is great. Well, I mean, I don't know. It, it, everybody's going to have a different answer for, the, for that. But for me, that's what, that's what it was. I, I hated copying. I hated being judged on how well or if I played somebody else's song. That, that really bothered me, mm -hmm. especially as a kid. Now, hey, man, did you hear that the guy down the street, hey, he can play Crossroads by the Cream, man. No for no. And I'm going, yes, so what? Can he play anything else? And sure as shit, he can't. He doesn't know how to apply. There's a prime example. This kid could play every note from the, from the solos from, from Crossroads, but couldn't improvise if his life depended on it. The reason he couldn't improvise is because he didn't learn to play the instrument like that. He learned to play what was on a record rather than oh wow that's how this works to actually understand how it works why it works the only way you're going to find that out is actually by discovering it by trial and error not by listening to it all being done perfect and then just try to play perfect you don't really know how did the guy arrive at that how did eric clapton arrive at that solo how did he why did he choose those notes and if you don't experiment and learn reason why <laughs> you're never going to know that's why you that's why it's very sort of detrimental to just learn what's on the record you're way better off to learn everything that isn't on the record to find out why that's on the record makes sense man makes sense well no that's what i'm saying but you know you've, you've been around and i know that's your opinion i know everyone else has their own opinion about it but uh, moving on, if we can, um, you know, I can't be talking to you, to you today without talking about your documentary, without, mm -hmm. about your movie. I mean, it's, it's just there. You know, 2008, we're to 10 years later, we're still here talking about it. It's just huge, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, this is, this is brought yeah, up. Yeah, well, the, the thing that gave it its longevity is, is the band itself. Yeah. If, the band was, if the band was a joke and didn't mean anything, it wouldn't have lasted a week. Right, right. You know, the, the movie is about a band that got, that got, that the music business failed, mm -hmm. right? Well, this and, is... And our existence beyond the movie and continuing proves that to be true. <laughs> you understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, well, this is like, like, I mean, it's, if, you, if you dig into it, it's one of the greatest rock stories ever told. I, the, I mean, thing is, you know, the thing is that people don't understand, and, they, and, and it, I, I find it really and you talked about it right on the onset, what is making it. Making it is a very basic fundamental thing. Making it is doing music that's yours and no one else's and only you can do it. And you don't have to play anybody else's but your own. That's making it. It doesn't matter how much money. The amount of money is, is not even relevant. It's just getting over the fact that you are who you are and what you are, that you own it. That's what making it is. It's nothing beyond that. 
It isn't. And as soon as you think it is, that's yeah. when you fall flat, flat on your face. That part is true for sure. Yeah. Well, you could set yourself up for failure, right? As long well, as that's you're right. You could, you, yeah. It, it, yeah, because, it, you know, oh, I, I'm expecting to sell this many records and you don't. I'm a failure. Well, no, you're not. Yeah. If that's what you're setting yourself, you're not really. What you're doing is you, you're creating an entity, a, a, a thing, and you're it. That's the success is being able to create it, not, not how much money it makes. It really isn't. It, some make more than others. That's it's as simple as that. That's really, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's better. It doesn't mean it's worse. It just means that the sheep, the sheeple, they prefer this over this. I mean, I'm playing metal music. I'm never going to be in the world of Madonna or or, yeah. or 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 Lady Gaga or any of the big pop stars. That's not the music I do. And trying to trying to touch that or go there with what I'm doing is 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 insane. And if you think that if you think that you you know as a metal metal thing like that and you think you're gonna change the world and get them all to love you, you're dreaming. And if that's what you're expect, if you have your, those, those expectations, you're going to fall short, and you're going to quit. That's what happens yeah. with a lot of a lot of guys. Hey, we had uh, members in our band who had uh, had ultimate dreams of big stardom. As soon as they saw saw or realized that it wasn't going to be like Madonna, it's like, what am I wasting my time for? Well, that's a good question. Yeah. What are you wasting your time for? Yeah. Go join Madonna. You should not, shouldn't be an anvil. I mean, you got to accept what you are and what you're doing and realize what it is and what its potentials are and what its, what its potentials aren't. And don't set yourself up, that, that's setting yourself up for failure. Mm -hmm. By far, there's way more people that hate my band than, than love my <laughs> band. I'm a metal band. <laughs> Of course, I wouldn't go it makes that far, sense. Right? Oh no, no, I would. How I, the movie proves it. If you want to go back, step back yeah. one fuck one moment. Okay, check it out. You got six million people have seen the movie or more, maybe more, probably a lot more. Mm -hmm. How many of them buy my records? That's true. Well, if you look at it that way, yeah. Well, yeah. It's the only way to look at. There's a <laughs> there's a there's a there's a movie. Yeah. There's the right. the, the, the sheeple right. and what they general. You got you look at. I'm standing, I'm standing in Chicago on a, on, a, on a busy street, waiting to go into a radio station to do an interview. All of a sudden, this limousine pulls up to the, pulls up to the curb, and this guy gets out in a suit, and he's freaking out. Oh, it's Anvil. It's Anvil. And he's taking pictures, get, gets his driver out. The guy's taking pictures. Less than two minutes later, a garbage truck is backing into the alley that I'm standing beside. And the garbage truck driver goes, oh my God, it's Anvil. He's doing the same thing. One guy's, one guy's a rich millionaire out of a limousine. The other guy's a huh. black guy, hard white collar worker, working as a garbage man. Wow. Neither of them will buy my album, but they both want my picture. Yeah. You, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'll never ever sell records to those people. No matter what I do musically, it's metal. They're not going to buy it. Okay, it's just it's just as simple as that. It, it just is. It just it's just the way it is. Um, so, on that on that level, it nothing really ultimately changed. But um, it's made it so that everybody wants to go see the band if yeah. they hear about it. Now there is a there's a, a little bit of a catch to it because the people that we generally do business with in the metal business where they're hiring us into clubs and so forth, they're not advertising where the garbage man or the rich millionaire is going to see it. They're advertising in metal magazines yeah. where you know both these guys are going. Where are you guys playing? Well, we're playing at so and so place, and they go. Oh, I never even heard about it. Well, I wouldn't expect you to. You never listen to the metal radio station. You never buy, you never get the magazine. So how would you know about it? And of course, the people we deal with don't advertise in mainstream places. 
it costs too much money and it's not they don't think it's worth their while and they don't have the ins to go and call those people say hey hello toronto star anvil's playing they don't, never even think of it right it's not that the toronto star won't pick up the pick up the the the, the phone or say oh, really where when i'm gonna we're gonna, we'll do a story on it no one bothers calling because they just don't even think to go there and then you know you go do the show and there's there's only a limited amount of people because it's only been advertised to that specific crowd and they never went outside the box where 90% if not more of the audience is there to come. You get what I'm saying? And I this totally is, understand. This is, yeah. this is what we've been dealing with now since the movie. Um, now, having said that, we haven't stopped working. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I mean, there's, a, there's millions of people that haven't seen us. You know what I mean? Yeah. As opposed to millions that have. Uh, just, I just want to touch on a few things just uh, before we let you get back to the show. Um, you know, just talking about what's, what's current. Um, we have um, five original albums in one box. Is that... Uh, oh, the yeah. The record company put together. Okay. It's one of those, it's one of those things where, um, you know, our, a lot of our middle era, everything between our third album and our... 12th album is is yeah pretty hard to find right um we we uh re-signed up to record deals and of course how do you get they don't want to put them out one at a time and try mm -hmm. to rekindle old fires so i think that it was a very intelligent thing they put a five box yeah. set together and they sell them as in one shot and we also have the anvil coffee oh yeah now, what happened there? How did, how did you get into the coffee business? Uh, it's just brand, yeah, brand yeah. name stuff. Yeah. You know, the, they made a, basically it's a, it's a big coffee company and it's a label company that makes labels. And then the label gets onto the coffee right, and right. that's how they sell it. So, yeah, yeah. and we get a percentage of, of not necessarily the coffee, but of the, the brand name. Yeah. Right, so you license out the brand names, you get a few cents per yeah. bag of coffee. <laughs> well, that's awesome. You know, lips. It's but it's good. good. Yeah. Well, I'm not a coffee good drinker coffee. myself, but I, I will but truly recommend good. it to everybody I know. So, anyway, listen, bro. It's been it's been a blast. So I just want to say thank you Thanks very, very much. much, man. I just want to wish you the best on the tour. And, thank you. You know, and uh, I just want to thank uh, Lips here from Anvil for joining us on uh, South Detroit Soundhouse. My name is Randy Falsetto once again, and I'll see you on the next chat. I could go on and talk to you all night long about oh, yeah, everything. Oh, yeah, no I doubt. Mean, and you, I could you, keep talking all night long, too. <laughs>